Hi, I'm Keith Lackner. For about the last four years now, I've been making these uh, resin infusion pieces, as I call them. And a lot of people out there have been asking me questions on how I do it. Uh, they want to see some videos of me actually doing it. So I decided the time's right. I'm actually going to make a couple of videos and show you guys how I make these pieces. Um, we're going to start from the very beginning of how I prep the wood, what products to use, what I use, and um, the molds and everything, and then the pressure pot, and then we're going to turn it up project when it's done. Okay, so today on today's episode, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make another version of my lidded box that I made that just everyone seemed to love. Um, I used Alumilite Clear. I used some blues, uh, Perlex pigments. I used some Clara Walnut, and I made uh, a really nice lidded box. I really enjoyed this project. I thought it turned out great. So what I'm going to do this time, instead of using the blues, is I'm going to change things up a little bit. I'm going to use my new Dragon Fire color that I developed for a piece that I did earlier this year. So I used a lot of oranges and uh, transparent dyes and some gold mica powders. So we're going to kind of walk you through and show you how I do that. And then instead of the Clara Walnut, what I'm going to do this time is I'm actually going to use a maple burl. I absolutely love turning burls. That's one of the things that got me really turned on to using... Uh, Alumilite, um, I just I absolutely love it. But the problem is, like you see with these burls, is you've got holes and voids that are in there. Um, casting resins work really, really great to help fill that and actually give it an accent. So something like this that I made out of a piece of mesquite burl. This was a big void that was here. I was able to fill that with casting resin, and now I've got a very beautiful one of a kind piece. So we're going to take you through all the steps that I've come up with. Like I said, these are my steps. They're not the only way to do this, uh, but there are a couple things that I will tell you that they are the only way to do things. Um, and that has to do with moisture and pressure. Um, you have to use a pressure pot and you have to have no moisture in your system, your process, your wood, whatever you're casting over. Those are the two most important things that people seem to get wrong. So we're gonna take you through a step-by-step -step of how to correct those two things. And then after that, it's pretty much the sky's the limit. You can make anything you want. You can make castings as tall and as big as you want. Um, I actually have one that's in process right now that I had to pour in a 25 gallon pressure pot that I have in the background. And when this uh, piece is done, it's roughly gonna stand about 22 inches tall and about 14 inches around. So this thing's a monster. It took, uh, took a lot of time, a lot of thinking and uh, I use probably about three gallons of resin to, to make this piece. So just to show you that the sky's the limit when you actually want to cast and you actually have your system and your process down. So hope you enjoy the show. Today's project begins on the bandsaw. The bandsaw is the safest and most efficient way to prep a burl. It's important when cutting smaller pieces of stock to always use a push stick. The resin we'll be using today is Alumilite Clear Slow. I prefer to use the Clear Slow for larger projects as well as the smaller projects. This way I don't have multiple resins in my shop. It's very important to weigh out both the A and the B in equal parts. For this I use a gram scale. As you can see, I like to mark exactly how much I'm weighing on the container itself. For this project, I'm using 700 grams of both the A and the B. It's very important to make sure that when you're mixing the two resins together, you get them as close to the exact weight as possible. For efficiency, I like to use a paddle bit on the end of my drill. I find it's the fastest way to mix the A and the B together. One of the problems that people have is that they think that the faster you whip stuff together, the more bubbles you're going to get. This is not true. As you can see, I'm going to use a paddle bit to mix everything very, very fast. It's the most efficient way to get it into your pressure pot after mixing all your colors together in the time that it needs to pulverize all the bubbles.
I switched panel bits to a smaller bit. This is the bit that I prefer to use when I'm mixing my colors together. I use the bigger one for mixing the A and the B together to make sure that they're thoroughly mixed together. When I mix my resin, I prefer to mix all the pigments in separate containers. I have it all weighed out or everything beforehand, and then I just mix the A and the B together and then pour it into the containers. When I'm all done, then I just mix the resin into the container itself instead of trying to figure out how to put different amounts into each individual container of the A and the B. This way I'm just mixing it in one big large group and then pouring it into secondary containers. I find it's the most efficient and best way to mix up your colors. Now it's time for my favorite part, actually pouring the resin into the mold. This is where you get to be as creative and artistic as you want. It's almost like painting with resin. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking a little messy here. Normally I'm a lot cleaner, but trying to pour and hold on to a camera at the same time seemed to be a little bit more challenging than I thought. You're probably wondering why I have duct tape on the top of my molds. The duct tape is used as a mechanical fastener, not allowing the pine cones to float as I pour the resin in.
It is very important to never exceed the certified working pressure of your pressure pot. My pressure pot has a max rating of 95 PSI. This allows me to cast at 80. So it's the next day. I always leave my molds inside my pressure pot overnight. Open it up the next day and I got a pleasant surprise. Everything looks the way that I want it to. If you get a really good close up here in a few seconds, you will see that there's absolutely no bubbles, no cracking, no anything at all. Um, it's a complete perfect cast. The rule of thumb is if you look at the top of your uh, casting and you start to see any type of defect that's in there, it's pretty possible that the defect is gonna follow all the way through your entire casting. As you can see on the larger mold, I put a piece of PVC piping in the center of it. That was just basically so that I wasn't wasting resin that I knew that later on I was going to turn away. Now for the fun part, getting it out of the molds. The top piece came out really easy. I used a, a mold release and a couple of cracks and it was able to come out. But when it came to the larger piece, it didn't come out as easy as the lid did. So I played with it a little bit off camera. I've mounted the base to my five inch Vicmark chuck. If you don't have a chuck this big, you could always glue a piece of waste block on and use whatever mounting method that you want. This is just basically to get it in the lathe so we could true it up. Once the piece is trued up, now it's time to cut the, the final dimension of the center piece. For this, I like to use a half inch bowl gouge with a 40-40 grind. I prefer to sand all the way up to a thousand grit and then once I'm at a thousand grit that's when I start to wet sand all the way to 12,000 grit. It really makes the resin pop. Ooh, just look at that shine. Now it's time for my favorite part, the hollowing. I prefer to start hollowing out with a bowl gouge. It's very important to take light, easy cuts. When you see a ribbon that's flying off of your bowl gouge, you know you've got it set exactly the way that it's supposed to be cutting. And the best part about cutting resin are the shavings. Just look at those ribbons fly.
Now I've switched over to my square carbide tip tool. This is the square tip axe tool by Carter Products. I find it is the best tool for finishing the bottom of this piece. Due to its design, it allows me to push in to make a push cut, and I could also use the sides as a shearing cut, cleaning up the sides and cleaning up any tool marks left on my bowl gouge. Here I've attached a waste block onto my face plate. This is for prepping the uh, maple burl that we prepped earlier in the very beginning. I've glued the big leaf maple burl onto the piece of waste block. Once the maple block is turned round, we need to mark two lines on the inside of the maple burl. This is to establish the dado for the resin piece to fit into. It's very important to stop the lathe from time to time to check your fit. It's really important that we get a nice, tight, snug fit for this piece. Once you've established a good snug fit, now it's time to part the top piece off of the bottom piece. We use a parting tool for this. To save time, since the bottom is done in the exact same way as we cut the dado for the ring for the top, I didn't show this step.
Now it's time for the glue up. I find it's best just to use two part epoxy and just use the lathe as a clamp. Here I'm just putting a soft curve on the band and a small cove on the bottom. I'm also taking this time to clean up any glue that squeezed out of the joint while, during the glue up process. Now it's time to cut through the band to expose the inside. We'll also be making a dado cut that will actually make sense a little bit later on in the project.
Now it's time to remove the base and put the 5 inch chuck back into the lathe. Once we have the chuck back in, we will mount the top piece and turn the top piece ready for the base. Here I'm cleaning up the face and getting it ready for my chuck. Since my jaws have a dovetail to them, I will need to cut a matching dovetail on the top. Now it's time to measure the data that we put into the band. This data was for the lid. Now it's time to start hollowing the inside of the lid. I do most of the hollowing with a bowl gouge.
Once I had most of the hollowing done, I switched over to my round nose carbide tip cutter. This is the round nose cutter available by Carter Products. As you can see, it's the most efficient tool for cutting the inside of resin pieces. You can make cuts going forwards and backwards very fast and efficiently. Here I'm doing final sanding on the lid. It's the exact same process as I used earlier in the project on the outside of the band. The lid has been reversed onto the chuck. The chuck has been expanded to grab a hold of the lid. Final shaping can now take place. Here I'm using a point tool. I find the point tool is the best tool for blending curves and removing any tool lines that are left behind, reducing the amount of sanding that's required later. The final step is cutting the hole for the finial. Once I'm happy with the fit and the proportions of the piece, it's time to remove it from the waste block. Once this is done, we will use the waste block to cut a recess to make a jam chuck, so we can turn the bottom.
To measure for the jam chuck, we first measure the inside of our piece with a set of calipers. We then transfer that dimension to our waist block. It's important to only touch one side of the upper jaw of the caliper to the workpiece. Move your caliper to the right or the left to form a perfect circle. To ensure a perfect snug fit, take light passes. Also, it's important to shut the lathe off from time to time to check your fit. It's very important to get a nice, snug fit. This is exactly what I want, a fit that's not too loose and needs a little bit of help to bottom out. Even though we achieved a nice tight fit on the jam chuck, for safety reasons we still use the tailstock. When a majority of the foot has been turned, only then do we remove the tailstock. Since we achieved a tight fit on our jam chuck, we have nothing to worry about. If your fit is a little loose, you will need to remove the last little bit off the lathe with a chisel or a die grinder and then sand by hand. If you achieve a tight fit like I did, one trick to remove your piece is to pull with one hand and tap the top of the waist block with your bowl gouge. Now it's time for the most important part of any project, signing your work.
Okay, so we finally finished today's project. We've got a nice, beautiful, lidded box made out of some pine cones. Um, hope you enjoyed watching the show. Right now, I'd like to take a few minutes to thank the people that helped make this happen. First off, I've got a really good friend of mine down the street, uh, Brian Scott. He did a lot of the filming for me. Um, a lot of the close-ups that I really could not do while I was trying to turn. And I know there was probably a couple times where Scotty thought that I was actually aiming my bowl gouge, so I was spraying them a little bit. Yeah, I really was. <laughs> I'm sorry. It was just, it was funny to me while I was turning. Um, second off, my girlfriend Jessica, she actually stepped in sometimes while uh, Scotty wasn't available to come in and help record. Um, so just thanks a lot to the both of you two. Next, I'd like to thank Carter Products. Uh, they've been making wood turning tools and accessories for fine woodworking since 1929. I've been using them the last couple of years and they are hands down uh, the best carbide tip tools in my opinion on the market. Um, they are the axe tools. I use them in this video. They also have uh, bandsaw attachments. Uh, I have a lot of their bandsaw attachments and uh, guides and bearings for my bandsaw. It really stepped it up to a very high professional level. Um, so I'd just like to thank uh, Lee Perez and everyone at Carter Products for helping me out and actually, you know, Without these people, none of this would have been really possible for me. Uh, so I got a lot of great people backing me up on this. I'd also like to take a minute to thank the people at Alumalite. Alumalite Casting Resin is the resin that I've been using for about five years now when I got started. Um, I use the Alumalite Clear Slow. Um, I just, I absolutely love it. And the reason I use it is hands down, my opinion, it is the best casting resin that's on the market. If it wasn't for this casting resin, I would not be able to make the big pieces and the colorful pieces that you see that I post online and are in art galleries all over the US. So I just want to take a moment to thank the people at Illumilite. Go to the webpage, check them out. They have just a wide variety of different casting resins that are out there. They also have mold making materials, the kits for molds, um, dyes, resins, or I'm sorry, dyes and mica powders. Um, I use all of their products. So um, just want to give a quick shout out to the guys of Illumilite. Thank you very much. So in closing, I'd just like to thank everyone again for coming into my shop and watching uh, me make my lidded boxes. Um, I've gotten a lot of great uh, support from a lot of you guys out there and uh, on the internet and Facebook and everything. You guys really like this. So, and I'm glad and I'm happy that you guys were able to come into my shop and watch uh, my steps and how I actually make this. Uh, you know, just stay tuned. We're gonna be making a lot more videos. I had a lot of fun doing this, um, but unfortunately it was, a lot longer than I thought. Um, you know, my hat's off to you guys out there that are making these YouTube videos. It is a lot harder than what it looks. Um, a lot of the editing and a lot of, you know, everything that goes into making these videos. Uh, it's so easy for me just to stand in front of my lathe for eight hours, but to make sure that, you know, I get the best shot and everything for you guys out there so you can see, you know, the way my bowl gouge is angled and uh, exactly the cuts that I make and everything. It was a little bit of a pain, but you know, I'm glad I did it. It was a great learning experience. So. Yeah, I've decided I'm going to make a lot more videos, so stay tuned.